If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to live by Hello and welcome to the Populist Dialogues, a project of the Alliance for Democracy. Our purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on a true democracy. I am your host, David Delk. Today we welcome back Portland Public Interest Attorney Dan Meek. He was our guest last week as we discussed various U.S. Supreme Court decisions, most of them five to four decisions, which have served to increase corporate power and decrease the ability of ordinary people like myself and our viewers to protect themselves from corporate harm. So we're going to pick up that discussion right where we left off. If you missed last week's show, please go to www.populistdialogues.org, click on 2013 to view that show. Next um, interesting case is um, Clapper versus Amnesty uh, International. And this was the case where there were a variety of folks, uh, attorneys, human rights organizations, labor organizations, media organizations, um, who um, sued the federal government to get them to stop intercepting their communications, uh, presumably the, their communications with people and, and, and entities overseas, because under the Foreign you know, Surveillance Act, supposedly the government, you know, this was, this was pre-Edward Snowden, so people didn't okay. know what, they were, what was actually going didn't on. Didn't know what was really going on. That, really. Um, um, and so they said, well, we communicate with people overseas all the time, and we think it's, uh, it's unconstitutional to intercept our communications. Little did they know, it didn't really matter if they were communicating with folks overseas or not, their communications would be intercepted. But So they brought the case, and um, the Supreme Court said, well, um, you don't have standing to, to challenge this. Even if it's completely unconstitutional to intercept your, your communication, you are out of court. It's another one of the, another one of the great uh, Scalia Roberts um, decisions of, of keeping people out of court. And it's just really remarkable how, what the basis of the decision. The, quote, first, it is highly speculative whether the government will imminently target communications to which respondents, and these folks are parties. Since respondents as U.S. persons cannot be targeted, under the law, their theory necessarily rests on their assertion that their foreign contacts will be targeted, yet they have no actual knowledge of the government's targeting practices. Okay, but no, the targeting practices are secret. Because they are top secret, right. um, and obviously you can't have knowledge of it. So you don't know if you're being targeted, well then you, <laughs> the, the, you have no matter. standing to challenge it. Second, even if respondents could demonstrate that the targeting of their foreign contacts is imminent, they can only speculate as to whether the government will seek to use the, authorized sur the surveillance authorized under Section 1881A of the Act instead of one of the government's other numerous surveillance methods, which are not challenged here. So, okay, so somehow you have to challenge all of the surveillance methods at the same time, mm -hmm. even the ones you don't know about. Yeah, okay. Okay? So, so in this case, they're narrowing down uh, to uh, only what you know. Uh, and in other cases, like Citizens United, which had a really specific complaint, uh, they broadened that to cover all kinds of other activities. That's right. They right. broadened it to cover to cover everything, including people who weren't there in, at the court. Mm -hmm. And they broadened it to it to they actually asked the parties to make arguments and, that they didn't make. Right. Mm -hmm. um, third, Clapper case. Even if respondents could show that the government will seek FISA, you know authorization, the FISA court authorization, to target their foreign contacts, they can only speculate as to whether the FISA court will authorize the surveillance because FISA court decisions are secret. So you can only speculate. Uh -huh. Fourth, even if the government were to obtain the FISA court's approval to target their foreign contacts, it is unclear whether the government would succeed in acquiring those contacts' communications. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, <laughs> so, so. unless the contacts are using, you know, uh -huh. uh, tin cans with a, with a string between them. That would be hard to, to intercept. But mm -hmm. so, so basically it establishes that the government can do anything it wants to in secret and nobody can challenge it uh -huh. on the basis of, of the Constitution because you don't know if you're being harmed. 
because yeah. it's secret. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a very brave new world. It's a very scary new world. Yeah. Uh -huh. Great. Well, on to uh, yeah. one of my favorite decisions. Okay. This was from last year, but it, uh, but there are, are follow-on cases and, and follow-on consequences. AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion, 5-4 decision again, gave um, corporations, um, it allows corporations to ban class actions against them and to require private arbitration of all disputes. That is, in this case, AT&T Mobility, obviously a you know, cell phone company, put in its, agree in, in its you know, the boilerplate of what you have to sign in order to get service. Oh, by the way, uh, even if we violate the law, et cetera, um, you know, uh, add charges to your bill that you didn't, that you didn't ask for, uh, whatever, um, you can't be part of a class action against this. So in some cases, there, there are class actions out there where uh, cell phone companies have been found to you know, automatically add um, $3 to everybody's bill for some sort of insurance that nobody, that nobody you know, signed up for mm -hmm. or something like that. You know, phone, losing my phone insurance. Now, a cell phone company can make hundreds of millions of dollars a year on that, on stuff that people didn't, didn't ask for and didn't order. Mm -hmm. But the only way to stop them, obviously, is to bring uh, an action against them and what the Supreme Court said is, well, you, uh, the, the, the corporations can ban you from bringing a class action against them, so the only thing you can sue them for is your own $3 a month. Well, that would hardly be worth my while to, right. to do that, because the cost of suing them would be much higher than, than the $3 I would recover. Exactly. Right. And so it means that corporations can do these things where they harm a large number of people financially uh, a small amount, amount that is too small to uh, justify going to court mm -hmm. alone on an individual by individual basis. Um, and these are, these are the cases which have been brought as class actions in the past and have, and have resulted in, in large judgments in favor of consumers. But the Supreme Court said, well, there's this 1925 Federal Arbitration Act. Now that act merely states that parties to contracts can agree to arbitration if they want to. It doesn't say that it uh, it supersedes and ab abrogates all contract law or allows um, a, a corporation or anyone else to basically exempt itself from the substantive requirements of law um, by saying, now, you can't sue me, you can't do me, sue me for a class action um, or for um, anything else. For example, the California law that was involved in that case invalidated class action waivers where disputes predictably involve small amounts of damages and, and where it is alleged that the party has carried out a scheme to deliberately cheat large numbers of consumers. Um, the Supreme Court said, nope, that statute, we're ab that statute doesn't apply because the corporation put in, its, in the boilerplate that you can't bring a class ac action and that you have to arbitrate, you have to arbitrate your claims. Mm. Now, what is arbitration? It's, it's privatization of the justice system. The justice system is all of the courts of, of, the, of the country, federal, state, and local. Um, judges are typically um, elected by the, by the voters, or in some cases, an, like in the Supreme Court, they're appointed. All federal judges are appointed, none mm -hmm. of them are elected. Uh, in many states, judges are appointed. In, uh, I think about half the states, judges like in Oregon are elected. You've got... Um, 200 year, more than 200 years of, of, hit of precedence when a, when a court makes a decision. It's published. It's public information. Um, you have very elaborate rules of procedure. The, you have the rules of civil procedure for trials. You have the uniform trial court procedures for trials. You have the rules of appellate procedure for appeals mm -hmm. on, both the, on both the federal and state levels. That's the justice system. It's a, it is, you know, a co-equal one of the co three allegedly co-equal branches of government, etc. Well, what's arbitration? According to, according to the Supreme Court, any company can make you, if you want their services or you want to buy something from them, um, can make you sign a contract that says you give up the entire, all of your rights to the justice system. And instead, you have to use the privatized justice system, which is called arbitration. The, in arbitration, the judge is selected from a panel of private attorneys. 
basically each side it is it, it, this is usually administered by a private organization. The American Arbitration Association is, mm -hmm. is specified in, in most of these contracts as the entity that administers the system. It's really a private super judiciary. Um, gives each side a list of like five arbitrators and their attorneys and typically the, nobody knows who they are. The attorneys who are handling the case for the consumer, for example, won't even know who they are. I'm on a, a list of small practitioners that are going to email list. The, they would be given a list of, right. of names, so mm -hmm. in that sense they know who they are, but they don't know, what is it they don't know then? They don't know their background. Okay. They don't know any arbitration decisions they've made in the past. They don't know if they are, if they are you know, under the, under the thumb or influence of the corporation. Um, and uh, I'm on this email list, and quite frequently attorneys say, I got this list of of five arbitrators and you sort of get a strike one or two. No. Uh -huh. uh, each attorney gets a strike one or two. Who the heck are they? Does anybody know anything about them? Uh -huh. So you're, you're stuck with peop people as your judges who you don't know, who aren't elected, who aren't appointed by government. And um, of course the other side, the corporation, also gets to strike you know, a, couple of these, a couple of these five or in order to determine who, who arbitrates. So if you are, and you get, arbitrators get paid, they make a living out of doing this. Mm -hmm. So if you are a, an arbitrator and you want to sit on actual, you want to sit on cases and make money, what are you going to do? The individual consumer who brought the case, you're never going to see that person again. Mm -hmm. The corporation, the cell phone company, the whatever, the, 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 um, you know, the department store or whatever, you're going to see them over and over and over. Mm -hmm. They are going to be able to strike you from future panels. So if you rule against the corporation, your career as an arbitrator is over, both because that corporation will strike you in the future, and that corporation will tell all the other corporations mm -hmm. to strike you in the future. So there's a built-in conflict of interest. Built-in massive conflict of interest, massive bias. Mm -hmm. okay? Now another feature of the, of the civil justice system is discovery. You file a lawsuit, you get, to, you get to then obtain documents from the other side uh, that are pertinent. And the other side has to produce them, and if they don't produce them, there are, there are rather severe sanctions, including losing the case. Um, in arbitration, you don't have the right to discovery. Great. Now, arbitrator's decision can be appealed only on grounds of fraud, not incorrectness. Now, if you go to a, to a regular trial court and you're suing the corporation or whatever, um, and the trial court just misinterprets, totally misinterprets the law and says, well, this law says the corporation doesn't have to pay anything, you know, whatever, you're, you're, out of, you're, you're gone, you lose. You can appeal that decision to the next level mm -hmm. in Oregon, it would be the Oregon Court of Appeals, on the basis that the trial court decision was just wrong. Mm -hmm. We misinterpreted the law. Not so in the case of arbitrator. You have to show that the arbitrator's decision was, was based on fraud, that mm. somebody bribed the arbitrator, for example. Okay. And that would be extremely difficult. It would be impossible. Typically, those things are done in secret. Yes. All right. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so it's, this is the, I think this decision is the most important decision the Supreme Court has made as a whole uh -huh. in this, under this regime. Okay. I mean, that and Citizens United. Citizens United, right up there. Oh, but yeah. So, and what was the name so of this, this one? one. AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion. Uh -huh. And in fact, his Concepcion actually had, no, there are many other, many examples of how this had an effect. Um, a person named um, Lourdes Cruz filed a class action against AT&T Wireless for charging $2.99 per month for roadside assistance service that the person never requested. Uh, the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals held that in light of the, the AT&T Concepcion decision, Florida law was preempted by federal law and Cruz had to go to individual arbitration. Mm -hmm. So he had to go to individual arbitration to try to get back the $2.99 per month that he had paid. Huh. So it's horrendous. This year, in American Express versus Italian College Restaurant, the Supreme Court said that um, American Express, in its contract with merchants who use its cards, can exempt itself from federal antitrust law. That is, it can force the merchant to sign an agreement that says, we will never challenge uh, American Express for violation of antitrust laws. Mm -hmm. Wow. So. <laughs>
again. Uh, yeah. And, and by the way, you have to arbitrate all the anything against us. You have to arbitrate, and uh, so there you go. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> in <clears throat> there are other consumer cases involving consumers. This this in this session that were uh, that were horrendous. A case called Marx versus General Revenue. The consumer brought an action against the debt collector, alleging that it violated the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act by making harassing phone calls and falsely threatening her for a debt that she didn't owe. Um, the federal trial court said not only did she, do, did she lose the case, but she had to pay the debt collector about $5,000 in costs for having brought the lawsuit. Now, under federal, the federal statute, it says that if you bring an action against the Federal Debt Collection Practices Act against the debt collector, the, the court can award costs against you, quote, on a finding by the court that the action under this section was brought in bad faith and for the purposes of harassment. Mm -hmm. In other words, that the consumer was brought the case, knew they didn't have a case against the debt collector, and brought the case against the debt collector in bad faith or for the purpose of harassing the debt collector. That's quite a concept, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Harassing the debt collector. The consumer oh, harasses yeah, right. the debt collector. <laughs> calls, like, calls them at midnight. Hey, I'm filing <laughs> suit against, I'm filing suit against you, buddy. Um, uh, but uh, that's, what the, that's what it says. But the court, Supreme Court said, well, yeah, it says that you can award costs on a finding that the action was brought in bad faith or for the purpose of harassment. But that doesn't mean you can't award costs even if the court doesn't make that finding. Oh. What? What? I mean, uh -huh. literally, that's true. But anyone with any sense would say, well, if you say that the court can do X upon a finding of Y, that kind of implies that you have, that you that have to find Y in right. order to do X. Mm -hmm. But what the Supreme Court said was, no, no, no. You can do X anyway. Mm -hmm. You don't need that finding of Y. Yeah. Okay. So, so they're just... They're really overriding the intent of Congress. Um, absolutely, mm -hmm. overriding it, uh, overriding the intent of Congress. Now, what I'm getting into are um, the way to that um, that Congress could change this. Um, we've mentioned in the earlier show that that Congress could have could avoid these decisions by the Supreme Court. Um, that harm consumers, uh, the environment, um, people injured by corporations, small investors, people who are discriminated against on the basis of, of race or gender or other, or other attributes, simply by removing the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, or, or for that matter, all federal courts, um, to review those kinds of, of statutes, mm -hmm. um, to declare them con unconstitutional or even to, <clears throat> or to um, strike them down on any grounds. Um, the Supreme, the Congress could do other things as well to uh, avoid these kinds of decisions on a practical basis. They could um, add two more justices to the Supreme Court and have President Obama appoint them. Mm -hmm. um, that would probably um, result, and as I mentioned, nearly every one of these decisions are five to four, and that would probably result in a decision in the other way around, six to five. Mm -hmm. So Congress could have done that. Um, then the, um, the, ob the objection to that seems to be, well, Congress couldn't have done that because that requires, you know, um, well, it would require only a majority vote in the House to do either of those things, either remove the court's jurisdiction or add two, ma two more justices to the Supreme Court. In the Senate, everything requires 60 votes, and we didn't have 60 votes. Well, first of all, for a while in 2010, the Democrats did have 60 votes. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, because they had the, the the two independents plus fifty eight actual actual Democrats, they lost the sixtieth vote when Scott, what was his name, the Massachusetts, um, when uh, when Ted Kennedy died, oh, and yes. Scott, oh I don't know, Scott somebody mm -hmm. was yeah. um, elected in Massachusetts, and he was a Republican, and he was a Republican. Right. That then right. they lost the sixty votes, but right. even so. Congress doesn't, the Senate doesn't need 60 votes in order to take action. And some of my illustrations here are that um, some of our favorite Supreme Court justices were confirmed with fewer than 60 votes. If, if it takes 60 votes, then why was Justice Thomas confirmed? Mm -hmm. he, he only got 52 votes. 
Yeah. Why was Justice Robert? Why was Justice Alito confirmed in 2006? He only got 58 votes. Yeah. It's because he only requires 60 votes are only required if someone filibusters, and if Congress allows the filibuster to occur and allows it to allegedly to to continue. Um, uh, despite a majority vote in the the other way around. Yeah, the thing that interested me about that chart, uh, Dan, was that uh, was the second column over here, mm -hmm. which shows how many Democrats voted for each one of these uh, conservative oh. justices, uh, which indicates that if the Democrats would stand up for their principles and stop voting for these judges, these justices would not be on the court in the first place. That's true. Um, when uh, Kennedy, for example, was confirmed. The Democrats had a 54 to 46 majority, mm -hmm. but they all voted for him. Mm -hmm. When um, Roberts was confirmed, the Democrats were in a minority. When Alito was confirmed, the Democrats were in a majority. They had 46 votes, but they still had 46 votes. Mm -hmm. And right now, the Democrats are allowing the Republicans to do anything in the Senate or to block anything in the Senate as long as the Republicans have 40 votes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you might ask um, why the Democrats, who have a majority in the Senate, allow the, the filibusters to continue. And the filibusters are, of course, much worse now than they used to be because about uh, 20 years ago, uh, the U.S. Senate adopted a rule that said that essentially you can have multiple filibusters going on at the same time, and you can do a filibuster without actually talking. You basically... All you need to do is send a note to the majority leader saying, I filibuster, and you don't even have to be on the floor of the Senate. It just mm -hmm. the, So at the same time, there, there are like 100 silent filibusters going on mm -hmm. in the U.S. Senate. Yep. And then they adopted a rule that said, well, yeah, you can filibuster. You send this note to the um, majority leader saying, I filibuster, but now you get to send a note to the, fil you get to send a note to the majority leader saying, um, I filibuster, and I'm not telling you who I am. Oh. <laughs> no. Okay. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. I am, you say, I am a senator, and I filibuster, and I'm not telling you who I am. And that's a filibuster now. Well, okay. So, the, curiously, um, the Democrats uh, have invoked what's called the nuclear option to actually require, to eliminate the filibuster um, in very strange unimportant circumstances. In October 2011, um, Harry Reid uh, invoked the nuclear option uh, on a bill to, uh, to uh, somehow make a declaration about Chinese currency manipulation. Mm -hmm. The Republicans, some, for some reason, threatened a filibuster. Um, Harry Reid invoked the nuclear option, and the, and the bill passed by a vote of 51 to 48. What? Passed with... 50, only 51 votes? So when the Democrats want to, they do things by a simple majority. Mm -hmm. They just don't want to, apparently, control the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. They don't want to uh, add two more justices to the Supreme Court. They kind of like what the Supreme Court is doing, apparently. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, unfortunately, Dan, our time is up again. And uh, so I thank you for being here, <laughs> and I, I know you have more to say, but we'll bring you back on again, and we'll continue this conversation. We'll do a three-hour show We'll next do time. a three-hour show next time. Right. Yeah. So our guest today has been Portland Public Interest Attorney Dan Meek, speaking on recent Supreme Court decisions which have been harmful to we the people and very beneficial to corporate interests. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populistdialogues to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an email notice. If you're watching on YouTube, you can help us expand our viewership. Contact your local cable access station and see how you can sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Most local stations are looking for good material, and we'll welcome the suggestion. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. 
Thank you to Roger Bates, Dave King, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And to all of you watching, thank you. I hope to, to watch again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock. Cause I never heard my money talk. When a corporation has a colonoscopy, then I'll believe they're human like me.